Welcome back to Statement Peace. Today we have a very special guest, Anna Gray, co-founder of Object Limited, a vintage buying and selling app. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> yes, happy to have you. Yes. So can you please explain a little bit of your background and um, how you got to where you are today? Sure. Um, I've been working in fashion for a long time, 11 years from when I was like 18 to 27. That's not 11 years, but the math works out. Um, <laughs> I started as a model and then I was in college in the city and I was just like doing all, all of the random odd jobs that I could find that included PR and styling and merchandising and normal retail sales and event production, et cetera. So I was wearing all these different hats. Um, but the end goal of all of these jobs was basically to sell more new clothes. <laughs> and I eventually got burned out and started questioning the processes that we sort of were just constantly keeping alive without questioning. And uh, a, it was a, a cross-country road trip with a friend where we took two weeks to go from upstate New York all the way to Arizona and stopped at every antique shop that we wanted that to that tickled our fancy and um, that really opened our eyes to how much supply was available in the world of secondhand and vintage and antiques. Um, and from there it sort of became the question of like oh well how do we get this into the hands of people that want it? Uh, why isn't more of this in an accessible place, i.e. the internet. Um, and from there, Object Limited was born. <laughs> the not shell version. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. So how do you see it differing from Depop and Etsy? It's very similar to Depop. So there are two ways to do a resale marketplace. There's the managed marketplace, like the real real, where they take your things for you and uh, shoot them and sell them. And then there's peer to peer, which Etsy, Depop, and Object Limited all are. Um, what makes Object different is the curated aspect. Uh, so, and it's also for now stri like strictly fashion, and on top of that, mostly women's fashion. So, it's for a very specific demographic of customer, um, which is it's fun that it's small and feels like a really warm, friendly, accessible community. But obviously the plans in the long run are to incorporate more home goods, more menswear. And then once the logistics are figured out, like furniture and things like that. So right now the difference between, the, the differentiator between Object and the Etsy and Depops of the world is the curation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know, so it started off with you curating everything, you and your co-founder curating everything on the site itself. And also it was a community-based kind of in-person event. Could you speak yeah, a little so more about that? It started as, so my co-founder, Rod Taylor, is the techie guy um, who works his magic in a way that I don't understand <laughs> and not being a developer. And uh, it started, Object started as a very small vintage pop-up shop where I would go bring a couple racks to my friend's nicer apartment and invite friends over to shop and we would like drink wine and eat cookies and hang out and it wasn't a scenario in which you felt pressured to buy anything but you know conversations about the circular economy were encouraged and like you know, people want to know the history behind the things that they're buying, especially in the world of vintage. Mm -hmm. So from there, it grew into friends being like, oh, I want to participate in the next one. Like, can I bring a rack of clothing? And I'm like, sure. And so it became this ever-growing amoeba <laughs> that turned into the question of how do we put tech behind this and like really make it a viable, scalable business venture. Mm -hmm. So at what point or what major factor made you decide to move to an online or app-based platform? Um, COVID. <laughs> I mean, we our app in its current iteration has been around since August last year. So 
we were we had an online presence and we're focused on building out our e-com since before august of last year like all of last year was figuring out what it was going to look like and how like how the product was going to be used and and what our vendors need and what our customers needed to like make the best app possible so people were happy to shop and sell on it mm -hmm. um, and then it was never we were always going to we call our multi-vendor pop-ups vintage bazaars and we were never planning on stopping those even if e-com became this like huge giant machine like the plan was to have and it's still in the works but you know with the our inability to gather it makes it more difficult um the community aspect of our in-person events is really important to the company and me and all of us as individuals um so we were just trying to figure out how to scale that also alongside the e-com whether it was like a tedx model where there could be simultaneous bazaars going on or we have like representatives in different cities doing them at the same time with their local vendors um so that on the ground scenario was never going to stop it just had to because of COVID. so we sort of moved them to social which has been doing pretty well actually so i know there was the component object studios so do you still plan on running that Object Studio was an experiment. Um, it was our longest running bazaar. I think it was six, it was six weeks. Uh, my friend Flynn was out of town and he has a restaurant on Forsyth, which is very well decorated. And so he let me rent it from him while he was in Europe. And I turned it into a sort of rotating pop-up shop where mm -hmm. we could have different vendors come depending on what dates and people could pick things up, they bought it on the app, that kind of thing. Um, it was really fun. I mean, I think that I'm not interested in having a vintage store. I don't, I think that's an, a wonderful, beautiful enterprise that doesn't scale in the way that I'm interested in scaling a business. Um, so that, I, in that sense, no, we wouldn't do another object studio, but I would like to continue doing these pop-ups. Right. So because pop-ups aren't as possible these days, what do you think technology's role is in the fashion industry and specifically for Object Limited? And how do you think COVID impacted that? Um, well, e-com across the board is skyrocketing. Our sales are skyrocketing. I think everyone is more aware of how detrimental fashion is on the environment. And so, you know, you can't turn off your consumer switch, which has been drilled into us since day one, um, but you can make better conscientious choices about where you're spending your money. The, before COVID, they were predicting the resale industry would be worth, I think it was like $30 billion in the next five years. And already they're predicting it to be twice as much at $64 billion by 2025. So it's a rapidly growing industry. And I think the fashion world, fashion proper, as I like to call it, <laughs> which is making new clothes, mm -hmm. whether or not they're sustainable or not, um, we'll start paying attention to those numbers. And hopefully technology meets it where it needs to be met. Mm -hmm. Right. And then on the same vein as COVID impacting fashion aside from sustainability i know you mentioned the article sweatpants forever so what what are your thoughts on this article and its relevance to covid and just in general sustainability as well because i know it talks a lot about even anna winter comments on the toxicity of fashion speed and such i think we're just looking at the article really makes clear that we're looking at the wrong margins or numbers when it comes to making decisions about what industries to keep going in the same way that they've been going forever. And it, and what really struck me about that article was that there was an admittance from this top tier collection of fashion proper brains who are very much leading the industry in whatever direction they decide makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. And none of them were able to articulate solutions to 
how the industry can change to better mitigate the, its environmental impact. But there are a lot of things that I think can be done to, to help the fashion industry keep all the jobs alive, make the consumer happy, keep the people at the top happy and still manage to make smarter decisions about materiality, production lines, supply chains, etc. What do you think will be, or I guess in your opinion, what do you think will be the major instigator for these larger fashion houses or what you would call like proper fashion uh, to make these changes as a whole? The consumer, your wallet has activism power in it where you spend your money is extremely important if you aren't buying fast fashion if everyone's else buying h&m clothing then h&m will stop making clothing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're only as right. they're only as successful as the dollars that they're bringing in yeah yeah i think we've discussed that a lot in our podcast and i think also gen z is as they become an increasing consumer base as a consumer base that looks for ethical consumption and transparency, um, I think it will hopefully head in that direction. So with that, how do you think social media has kind of altered this Gen Z agenda for sustainability and helped you grow your business as well? People will get called out if they're not doing the right thing. And if Gen Z, who's doing a great job of this from what I can tell and what I've observed in the back end of Object Limited is like, they will hold themselves and each other accountable to making the right decisions. And hopefully that continues in like a place of kind education and not like scary bullying. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in that way, and social media also on the other end, like a, what I was saying earlier about uh, it being so easy to grow a business into something really successful very quickly now, like Instagram fully helps you find great vintage vendors, great retailers of, in any category across the spectrum of aesthetics and um, lets people make sales in a way that they, you know, they're not buying Google ads anymore. Yeah, yeah. Learning I, SEO. So it's a little antiquated at this point. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've definitely found a lot of vintage vendors through Instagram. And recently on our past episode, we talked about how it's interesting Instagram's update where it's mostly, or it definitely promotes what Instagram's priority is at this point, which is kind of opening it up to a marketplace. You want to make money. Yeah. <laughs> but also, I think one of the first <laughs> times I saw Object Limited was on social media. And I think it was one of the, like an Instagram video where you were dressing different outfits or whatever it may be. Right. I should talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We have a TV show called How to Wear Stuff. <laughs> it's on Instagram. Uh, that's been really helpful for us because I think to maybe to the newbie, vintage can be really intimidating. I've been shopping vintage since I was like five years old because my mom loves shopping vintage, my grandma loves shopping vintage. And like then when I became a teenager and was like making my $10 an hour, I was could only afford to buy vintage um, if I wanted to experiment with my wardrobe. So the intimidating factor of vintage I un or secondhand, I understand because uh, a question I get a lot is like, oh, how do you make it not look costumey or how do you make it look more modern? And so in response to this question that I was getting a lot, I was like, well, maybe we just make this TV show because clearly the, what comes innately to me or is a, a practice that I've cultivated over all the time that I've been interested and then worked in the fashion industry is like putting outfits together. Right. So Enough. do you ever alter the pieces? Um, because I know I, I've seen a lot of blogs where they talk about a similar thing where vintage is hard to style and can be intimidating, um, but then they end up showing how to alter it. So do you do that as well? So that's interesting. There's something that I like to consider when I'm buying secondhand. Um, if I'm in thrift stores, like Goodwill or Salvation Army that are like community thrift stores, so they're designed and 
created for the community that they're in, i.e. their price points are super accessible because they're oftentimes what the people in that community can afford to buy. So if I'm buying from stores like that and I'm buying oversized pieces, I don't alter them because I know I'll put them back into the ecosystem. The circular economy is where you buy something and you're like, wow, this is great. I love it. And then you have it for a little while and then you're like, no, no, really where it's been sitting in my closet for six months. Uh, and instead of throwing it away, you can donate it or you can give it to a friend or you can sell it on, I don't know, object limited perhaps. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it just keeps things in the cycle. And it's like a great way to not feel guilty about your purchases because you know that you're going to give them another life in other hands again. For things like jeans, yes, I'll take it in. Um, but it, I mean, if it's close enough to my own size, then I don't mind altering. So to speak more about the tech side and just developing the app and everything, um, I was going through it today and how, how did you kind of figure out which things that you wanted to keep or prioritize for the interface and how user-friendly it is, or even the look of um, like the app cover art and everything? The bare bones wireframes were like, this is what as a vintage seller and a vintage buyer myself, and also Maggie Lanham on our team is also a vintage seller buyer. So together we were able to determine what tools we needed to make the selling experience great. And then as customers, we were able to determine what tools we needed to make the buying experience great. <laughs> But if someone handed me $50,000 to spend on a design team, none of us are designers, by the way, then I think it would look a little bit different. Um, but it works perfectly well for what we needed to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so do you mind explaining or speaking a bit more to your team size and how you grew from you and your co-founder to where it is today? Uh, there are, yeah, there are five of us on the sort of creative marketing side. It's me and Maggie Lanham, who's our operations associate. And then my co-founder is our CEO slash CTO. And he has two developers, Rocky and Max, who are great. So to speak about Bumps, what do you think is the most valuable experience, learning experience while developing Object Limited? Well, okay. Recently, I was like, do you, I was talking to my friend, David, and I was like, do you think I should go to grad school for business? And he was like, everything you could possibly learn in grad school, you just got a crash course in by working on this company for two and a half years. Um, you know, for example, I thought this was a brilliant idea and we, <laughs> and so did Rocky and he, we were, and he developed this, um, magic eight ball where it will basically the app would send you a notification weekly that was like we think you would like all these 10 things based on everything that you like this week like that makes that sounds like it would be a great feature didn't work no one cared <laughs> <laughs> and it for a week and no one was interested and we're like okay it's fine kill it <laughs> so what you see now is you know the the end result of a lot of those kinds of experiments Mm -hmm. um, so to go back to your kind of early career, um, when you were younger, was this what you wanted to do? And then with that, what did you study and intend on studying? Did you go to college? I went to college. I moved to New York from Virginia, 18. My parents were like, get out of the house, goodbye. Um, the reason I went to new school, I went to Eugene Lang to study literature. American contemporary literature. I did not care about college. I fucking hated school. I was terrible in high school. I was a horrible, rambunctious brat with an authority problem. And I was like, I don't care where I go. I just want to be in New York. The only way I can get to New York is if I get into college. I moved to New York because I like, wanted to be cool and, and famous, basically. Is there like a specific pathway that you wanted to take? Because I know you mentioned you started modeling early on. So did you always want to work in fashion or were you just kind of seeing? 
I always wanted to work in fashion because I love clothes. Uh, I love the dormant. I love the communicative aspect of a dormant. The, I was talking to my analyst today. <laughs> and uh, I was like, do you think I have an entrepreneurial brain? And he was like, you definitely have an entrepreneurial brain. Like, that's why you have such problems with authority and the status quo and like are always trying to do things in a, as weird a way as possible. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. He's like, but it kind of means you're not afraid of failure. And I was like, no, I'm not afraid of failure. <laughs> I would describe Catherine the same way. <laughs> <laughs> it comes from being, I don't know where it comes from. I mean, my parent. I was like a first generation American. Neither of my parents were born here. I always grew up being like the weirdo kid who never quite fit in. And I was like, at some point, instead of being bummed about it, it was like, this, I could use this to my benefit. Maybe Catherine went, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I, I relate a lot to your experiences because I always wanted to be in New York and modeled at a young age because I grew up in LA. So I think like the yearn to be a part of like fame and blah, blah, blah was definitely there. And then, but I went to Wellesley because I wanted to like pursue academia and like be taken seriously. Um, and then in June, I started my own business. It's like a Gen Z oriented marketing and management consultancy. But I, and then I started a full time job um, last month. And I, I feel similarly, um, I guess, as, as you were saying, because I, I don't like the status quo or like normalcy. It just feels like really medio mediocre to me. I, I just feel like I'm being lumped into mediocrity when I do a nine to five situation. And it's not busy and there's not like crises happening. I don't know. I, I like the drama. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think even today, me and Catherine were just exchanging text messages about different things. And we both like have full-time jobs, do the podcast and also have like other projects going on. So it's always like, I feel like we like to have that, <laughs> I guess, change and, you know, no day is the same. Yeah. Yeah. Driving in the chaos is an important important skill set I think and maybe probably pretty rare and I think it's what is often the catalyst for change is people who are like but why do we keep doing the same thing over and over again for yeah. sure yeah um, so what were your different jobs modeling freelance writer I made no money uh, <laughs> PR didn't do that one for very long because I fucking hate it um, <laughs> event production. I was consulting for the Frankie shop for a while. I really liked that job because I love Gael, but then I stopped working with new clothes. Um, and I was like throwing fun little events for her and other brands. Uh, what else were they doing? I was styling for a minute, not very long, too much heavy lifting. Uh, <laughs> I worked in, actually worked in I was an executive assistant for a media consultant for a minute. That was fun. I learned a lot about how to write a convincing email um, and like juggle a lot of people's calendars. Uh, what else did I do? I worked at Home Polish. I was in interior design for a year and a half. That was my first foray into startup world. Um, well, I had a magazine. <laughs> Oh, girls I know with my friend Jen Steele. That was really fun. We had that for two years um, where we interviewed, we were pretty ahead of our time. We were interviewing women about their different definitions of success and happiness, mm. like taking photos of them. Um, that was in 2012. Wow, getting old. Um, what else did I do? I think that's it. Wow, that's awesome. Um, I'm curious to know how your experience with modeling has shaped your experience now with Object Limited. Because I think I always think about how models are treated and things like that, having modeled myself. And then whenever I see like other sets that my friends are running, like I've modeled a few times for um, companies where I know the founder and I always observe how they treat models as well. Yeah, well, I've never employed a model since working at opening or object limited because I do all the modeling because it's cheaper. Um, so 
being a peer to peer marketplace. So the vendors are in charge of their own styling, casting, shooting, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But I mean, as uh, with modeling in my background, I don't know. I mean, whenever I'm on set now, it's only be for friends, brands or brands that have are sustainable or eco-conscious so it's nice to have made it this far that I can and you know having a full-time job I can say no to projects because I don't have to take them just for money um modeling sucks it's terrible it's like <laughs> it's a ca I used to work oh here's another job I had I was in casting for a minute for <laughs> my friend Noah <laughs> and he was like casting huge shows in Paris and London and New York, Milan, and I would like go around with him and be like, this is so, even from this side of the table, it's fucking, this job sucks. Um, it's, it's, it, I know so many models and the energy required to disassociate your body from your emotionally intelligent and intellectual side is so big and heavy and I don't think talked about enough where you're just expected to not have an opinion on anything ever yeah yeah it's been kind of interesting we did one episode where I just talked about unpaid labor um in modeling and then we looked at articles of related content but um yeah it is it is a bit weird like I've had to sometimes like low-key ask for payment if it's an unpaid opportunity and it's just I don't know it's very like backdoor it seems like kind of shady sometimes and especially with COVID this like labor standards I feel like are really important yeah um time but, is money as Warren Buffett said he's like I can buy anything but I can't buy time it's why my calendar's empty <laughs> <laughs> regardless of whether or not they're your PA they're a model like I mean, I don't know if you need a good line, but I'm always like, what's your budget for talent? Instead of being like, pay me, pay me. <laughs> yeah. Open some things. But, um, or if it's a job I don't want to do, I tell them my day rate's $10,000. They always say no, but <laughs> <laughs> it makes me feel good. <laughs> well, where do you see Object Limited going in the future? Uh... I would like it to be, I would like all the vendors to have their own how to wear stuffs. I would like everyone in the world to only buy secondhand and understand that the supply chain for secondhand is readily available, even if you're making new things out of old things. Um, and I hope that object, you know, gets, we, we managed to foray into other categories of furniture, cars, whatever. So that right, right. one stop shop for you to aesthetically improve your life with utilitarian and beautiful objects. Um, so then if you had to pick one statement piece in your wardrobe, what would it be? Probably a coat. I have this really good camel long Max Mara overcoat that I like a lot. Oh, that was amazing. How do you go about um, picking the different kind of like vintage vendors for Object Limited? Uh, in the beginning, it was like cold outreach. Mm -hmm. um, I like going to stores and being like, hey, do you want to sell on this app? <laughs> um, and then I was cold emailing people and then I was talking to vendors that I already knew because they were friends um, and, or I was talking to friends that I knew wanted to clean out their closets. Uh, and then from there, it sort of started snowballing on its own. In the beginning, we were, you had to apply to be a vendor. That was like a sort of sneaky tactic to seem exclusive, mm -hmm. uh, but also just because we didn't have the bandwidth to take anyone on in any volume. <laughs> uh, and then we took down that sort of barrier. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much for being on. Um, it was great to hear your story and just understand better sustainability and especially talk to people that are passionate about it.
yeah thanks yes, for definitely having me on yes and i'm excited to see what object limited is going to look like in the future yeah me too <laughs> <laughs>